Half the world's population is under the age of 30, and we can expect around 11 billion more people to be born this century, more than are currently alive. So unless we design justice systems that work for young people, unless we prepare justice systems that are ready for the justice seekers of the future, we really will not be doing our job. Children and young people have very distinctive justice needs. They also have increased vulnerability to injustice, especially when they are very young and cannot speak so easily for themselves. And as they get older, they're increasingly on the front line as our justice um, providers. So at all levels, the need for justice, uh, the need for a focus on justice for young people is incredibly strong. Last year, from the UN Secretary General, we saw a report on the future of international cooperation called our Common Agenda. And in that report, he made it clear that he believed that people-centered justice was absolutely fundamental to reimagining the social contract in our societies and to building more just relations between countries. These are urgent challenges at a time when the world is under extreme pressure. He also asked my organization, the UN Foundation, to provide a platform for young people to contribute to his um, thinking. And as part of that work, Elisa Jimenez, then part of the Pathfinders for Peaceful, Just and Inclusive Societies, and now at the Center for Policing Equity, brought together a group of young justice experts and practitioners to provide the Secretary General with ideas and suggest recommendations. They argued that providing justice for young people is one of the transformative shifts that we need to unleash the power of a new generation. And from their work emerged the idea of forming the young justice leaders to bring together leaders who happen to be young and who are working for justice. Today's session formally launches that group, the Young Justice Leaders as an entity, and as a fundamental part of the Justice Action Coalition. And we're going to hear directly from Elisa in a, uh, in a few minutes about the origins of the group. On the slides, in a, in a couple of minutes, you're going to see the members of the um, Young Justice Leaders, a fantastic um, group from across the um, world, and you'll be able to read their biographies in the link I think somebody is placing in chat. Here in The Hague, though, we're proud to have two of the Young Justice Leaders with us. I would like to introduce on my left Vino Lucero, a journalist and freedom of information advocate from the Philippines who works to promote digital rights and data justice and to defend and expand and create civic space. Vino is from the Philippines, but he's working both regionally and globally. Welcome, Vino. Thank you. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Shanil Lal, a campaigner who has helped end conversion therapy in New Zealand, a massive campaigning achievement, and a writer, creator, researcher, political commentator and model with expertise in areas that include queer and indigenous rights issues. Welcome, Shanil. And then we are also incredibly honored to have one of the world's leading champions of intergenerational justice join our panel. Mary Robinson is the former president of Ireland, a former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and very much a current champion for gender equality, peace building, climate justice, and the rights of future generations. Mary is here in her capacity as an elder and as chair of the elders. Welcome, Mary. As I said, we're going to start today's session, session with Elisa. Elisa, I think you're going to be appearing on the, uh, on the screen. So thanks so much for being one of the many people who are joining us online uh, today. Uh, Lisa, if you can hear me, I wonder if you could give us a flavor of how you and the other young justice leaders took the initiative to form this group and what role you hope the justice leaders can achieve ahead of the SDG Summit in 2023. Lisa, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, David. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and I'm just be here virtually. Um, and I'm just really happy to be able to share the same space as many of the other um, individuals that you just mentioned. So thank you again. Um, so as David mentioned, I was previously with the Pathfinders and I was working on the justice team. Um, and as a a relatively young person myself, um, a big element of the work that I was doing um, was identifying other individuals in the space who were change makers. Um, and no surprise to many of the people on this call, a lot of them were young. And a lot of these discussions that we were hearing around the 2020, around the agenda and the lead up to 2030, as well as conversations around how to really 
catalyze true change um, in what people-centered justice look like, a lot of those examples were coming from leaders on the ground um, who were also young. And in in the summer of um, 2021 um, and in the fall, there was a report that um, David's organization just mentioned, UN Foundation, which was run by the UN Foundation Next Generation Fellows. In this report called titled Our Future Agenda, it was written by young people um, who are leaders in, in their respective fields. Um, and this report, which was commissioned and specifically asked for by the UN Secretary General um, in their office, it articulated the need for people-centered justice as critical to achieving essentially anything. It's a key unlocker, um, such as uh, many other elements, such as education um, too. And while this may not have been a large surprise to many of the people working on the ground, of course, it did serve as a really important moment in a space that typically um, did not elevate the voices of young people in ways that were as effective um, as previous um, were that could have been as effective. And this, uh, this report and the access that this report demonstrated what that said to people in the larger SDG community was this is the time. This is the moment to seize um, this opportunity um, where young people have truly been given authentic opportunities for engagement. And, you know, truly just in conversations with a lot of my colleagues and in a lot of the other um, spaces that I had the opportunity to be a part of, individuals were talking and discussing how to mobilize around this opportunity that we were seeing that was coming out um, and being symbolized by this report that had just that I just mentioned. And in a lot of conversations, what really came up was how to bring individuals together around justice and people-centered justice. So no surprise, as I was working um, with the Pathfinders for Justice group. And it's really what came out of that discussion was in the true nature of what Pathfinders does and a lot of these spaces was serve as a convener. And what ultimately was discussed and what was decided upon was the true need to ensure that there was a space for young leaders who were implementing people-centered justice and really answering the question of how to improve uh, people's lives um, related to justice, whether that was working to end conversion therapy um, in New Zealand, that the example that David just mentioned that Chenille led, or the work around um, privacy and, and freedom of press uh, that Vino and other call in other members of the Young Justice Leaders has lead has led. And how to get this group of people together to ensure that they are given the opportunity to speak, um, to speak and to be connected to other people in the larger SDG space. Brilliant. And I think, exactly. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that these people were all leaders in their own right already. And this was really an exciting opportunity uh, for us to come together and provide that space for them um, just to amplify the work they were already doing. So thanks, Elisa. Huge congratulations on the work that you've done to make this happen. And now we're going to hear from a couple of the justice leaders about the practicalities of their, of their work. So, Vino, you've heard from Elisa. She said that justice is the key unlocker. She's also said that this is the, um, this is the time. You were selected from a large cohort um, to be one of the young justice leaders. What do you think you bring to the group and what are you hoping to achieve by having this global platform? Thanks for that question, David. Um, for me, uh, working as an investigative journalist and now as somebody who's doing work around the topic of digital safety and internet freedom in South and Southeast Asia, I definitely worked alongside um, representatives of marginalized communities, those experiencing injustice in the, on the ground. So um, I want to use this platform to actually amplify their voices so that um, this um, global audience can learn more about um, what they're experiencing, what it's like to be living their life um, through um, their perspectives. So I, I want to use this to highlight that. And then at the same time, use my learnings working alongside um, representatives of the, these marginalized communities to create this vision of how I want to contribute in improving the situation on the ground in the grassroots and as well as um, 
doing policy advocacy work, take for example, I want to use that fashion and use this Young Justice Leaders program opportunity to actually implement those, put effort in those work. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. And let me then turn to you, Chanel. I mean, you're a, in your early 20s, you've already achieved a significant campaigning success that's led to real change in the justice system in your own country. How do you plan to use this global platform? Where, where next for you as a young justice leader? Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. I greet you in the language of the indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I am Chanel and I'm one of seven young justice leaders, as you said. Uh, I was born in Fiji, a colonised Christian island nation. Um, and I grew up in a Fiji in a time where homosexuality was criminalized and the practice of praying the gay away was rampant. So for me, growing up in Fiji, accessing justice was never an option. I moved to Aotearoa, New Zealand when I was 14 years old, but I left behind the people that I loved who were queer, just like me. And... Uh, Many Pacific Islands, including Samoa and Tonga and the Cook Islands, still criminalize homosexuality. And that gives rise to the question, how do you get justice when the systems built to provide you with justice deem you a criminal for simply existing? The Pacific Islands are isolated from the world, but unfortunately the British colonizers found us anyway. The global community, or synonymously known as the international um, community, has conveniently overlooked and ignored the human rights crisis in the Pacific. I joined the Young Justice Leaders because I wanted to amplify the voices of people that have been neglected by the global north. And I hope that through conversations like this, we will achieve that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. So. Turning to you, uh, former President Robinson, in recent years, the elders have made a huge commitment to people-centered justice with your fellow elder, Hina Jelani, co-chairing the Task Force on Justice that launched its findings here at the World Justice Forum um, three years ago. And since then, the elders have focused on closing the justice gap for women and have also been at the forefront of driving implementation on all of the justice targets um, uh, that we find in the SDGs. I've had the honor of seeing you advocate for that within the United Nations in New York. Given the elders' commitment to intergenerational dialogue and action, how, how do you react to what you've heard from the young justice leaders? And what do you take from the commitment of Elisa, Vino, Vino Chenil, and other members of the group? Well, I'm very happy to be present at what I understand is actually the launch of this young justice leaders because, as you mentioned, the elders are very keen on the intergenerational dialogue. That dialogue has changed since I was growing up. Uh, I had a beloved grandfather who was a retired lawyer because of ill health, and he didn't know how to speak to a child. So he spoke to a 10-year-old, 11-year-old girl who couldn't get enough of this grown-up conversation about justice. And then I would go back and my brothers would treat me as my, a 10-year-old, 11-year-old. But it was the oxygen of being recognized as a child for intelligent conversation. Um, and it brings out you know, that we, we, we need to go not just to young justice leaders, but children's rights in this context as well. But um, the elders, we work very closely with young climate activists and we learn so much from them. As I learned this morning from talking to the two of you and two other colleagues, um, you know, that, um, you know, uh, you live in a very socially social media connected world. You have huge outreach in what you do, um, so it's really important. For example, um, you know, I fought against the criminalisation of homosexuality in Ireland. Um, you know, I, I can't. I just know how important it is um, to address this in the Pacific Islands and to, under, you know, to be able to communicate um, uh, you know, through social media far more than I was communicating in the old days last century, but nonetheless uh, for justice reasons. So I, I think the young um, justice um, uh, group will, will, will play a very real role in the overall uh, uh, way in which we understand the gaps and the lack of access to justice in our world. I, mean, I, I belong to that previous panel, um, the uh, Committee on Legal Empowerment of the Poor. Yes. Um, and you know, I was quite 
taken aback when we concluded that about four million people don't have effective access to any form of justice, use informal means of trying to um, combat all the burdens and indiscrimin you know, discriminations, etc. And th the task force came out with a worse number, five million um, in our world today, you know, which, which again was, um, was, was quite a shock. So we really need young people to drive this agenda, frankly, drive this agenda. Young people speak truth to power and we need justice to be spoken about firmly, in principled ways, with data-driven you know, evidence um, you know, to, to back up uh, the justice case. So before we go on to hear about some of these concrete um, plans, I mean, Chenille, you you're, you're campaigning um, for the legalisation of homosexuality today. You've just heard from Mary about her work to do that in Ireland earlier in her in her career. How do you how do you feel when you when you hear about her experience, and how do you think it's possible for elders and young justice leaders um, to work together in the in the future? Me and Mary had a lovely conversation this morning, and we we talked about this quite a bit. And I think. Uh, when it comes to queer rights activism, it's such an intergenerational thing precisely because our progress is incremental. So we didn't get to the decriminalization of homosexuality and the right to marry in the same decade. We got them over time and I feel like fundamentally the desire for justice remains. But now it just looks different. For example, in New Zealand, we decriminalized homosexuality in the 1980s. We got the right to marry in 2013. We banned conversion therapy in 2022. Things look different, but it's the same goal, to treat people equally. And, and Vino, you know, you've, um, you've heard Chenille talking about the issue, but you've, you've, you're in the digital space. That's your, your world. And Mary has pointed out that this is really a game changer. Can you say something about both the opportunities and the risks that you see for justice in that, in that digital space? Mm -hmm, definitely. So I see it that for advocates, um, it is another way to reach more and more people to, to raise awareness. Um, but then at the same time for um, advocates like me um, and somebody take, for example, I am a gay non-binary journalist and there is a different kind of attack uh, for for marginalized groups online. So I feel like while we definitely use um, the internet and social media to um, reach a lot of people, um, we also need to be aware about how to protect um, these advocates and ourselves when interacting online. So I think digital safety take, for example, is something that we can uh, talk about across generations. So Mary mentioned that she's very interested about it. And I feel like um, that interest is shared by a lot of people because um, everybody wants to be safe online, especially when they use social media. So, yeah. Okay, so let's move on to the, the meat of this. Um, it's the Justice Action Coalition, this high ambition coalition that's come together to prepare for the SDG um, Summit. And the Young Justice Leaders are not just there for words. You're already thinking quite clearly about what your theory of change is, what your strategies are, how you're going to, what tactics you're going to do um, to. Uh, what you use to take those objectives forward. Can you just give us, uh, give our, our, our audience, both here in The Hague and online, a flavor of what you think you're going to be doing over the next year or, or two and what you hope um, to achieve? I'll, I'll, I'll hand that over to both of you. Yeah, definitely. So on behalf of all the young justice leaders, we're, we're seven in the group. Um, some of them are actually watching right now. Hey, all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Shanili and I are very proud to talk about uh, some of the thematic action points that we want. First, we want to start our work um, with the realization that for most of the global population, their experience interacting with justice institutions and with justice, the topic of justice in general, um, they see it as something that is inaccessible to them, something that is um, for the elite, for the rich, for the privileged. And um, these experiences and these notions are being passed on from one generation to another. So we want to start by introducing um, the concept of people-centered justice, this vision of people-centered justice to the general public, to uh, to people of, from all walks of life. So that will definitely take some uh, multi-sector collaboration, especially to reach people at the grassroots, to let them know that um, the justice that um, your interaction with justice, that is not what we're aspiring for. We're aspiring for 
people at the center when it comes to all to justice processes. And for us to be able to get there, um, to put people at the center, one crucial thing would be to have access to justice data because you know if people have access to justice data and, and information they are able to participate more in introducing justice reform or pushing for um better services related to justice or accessing justice so um some of the young justice leaders are very interested in looking at how we can contribute working with um different uh, sectors when it comes to looking at how um, different countries or even regions uh, are experiencing access to justice data in relation to the right, uh, the people's right to information. And then, Janine? Yeah, I want to talk briefly about the idea of financing justice. One of the things about justice is that it is the work to achieve justice is often done by people who need it. Um, resourcing justice solutions is critical to ensuring that marginalized people who are leading change are not burnt out. What we know about activists is that they are tired and no one is paying them to cry. So ensuring that justice solutions are financed is uh, ensuring the well-being of those people. We need to create sustainable solutions and sustainable movements and sustainable solutions are created by people who are supported. The next point is reimagining youth justice. Now, this is a broad idea, but I want to talk about the unjust criminalization of young people around the world. The generation that is, in, that is currently in power have this tough on crime attitude, and what that has resulted in is the unjust criminalization of young people across the world. In New Zealand, a 16-year-old can be prosecuted for murder. But the newer science is absolutely clear that a young person has not fully developed till the age of 25. Criminalizing young people disrupts their well-being and their educational and employment prospects and it traps them into a lifestyle of offending. We need to move away from this Western idea that young people are autonomous individuals and focus on the socioeconomic factors that are driving crime. If the people in power are serious that young people are the future, the least I expect them to do is keep the future out of prisons. Okay. And then another point that we're interested in looking at would be um, how injust uh, injustices in real life are being replicated and even magnified online. So take, for example, uh, violations of privacy. We um, A lot of people experience that in real life, but then at the same time, governments and big corporations, big tech basically, are also doing that to our online personas, our online accounts, take for example. So um, we want as young justice leaders to have um, engage people across generations from all walks of life about their rights online. And then when it comes to how to um, exact accountability and justice from governments and big corporations in the case that they experience injustices in the digital space. So um, these thematic actions that we want to do, um, of course, we want to do it by collaborating with um, members of other generations and other sectors as well. So take, for example, we're interested in doing a, a national and regional level research. That will definitely take some support and some co-creation process with um, members of the academe, other members of civil society, even governments. So we are definitely looking forward into that. Some of us are interested in um, consolidating movements and um, creating an organization even um, in spaces wherein there is a need to consolidate advocates and create an institution or an organization. In Asia Take, for example, we're interested in creating an organization that will promote um, awareness about your rights online and how to exact accountability and responsibility from governments just in case you experience violations online. I would say, as, as my final point, the idea of supporting young people to have a say at the table. Because what often happens is that people, adults, sit around the table and talk about our rights without us at the table. And I think this here is a good example of having young people involved in conversations about young people because you cannot form anything for us without us. So yeah, let's turn this back to you, Mary. I mean, you've heard 
some themes, you know, the focus on people-centered justice, the need for data to understand what on earth's going on out there, finance, particularly for people on the front lines who are not paid, these, this awful problem of how young people are criminalized. And then we've also heard some of the tactics for, for making that happen, including the last plea, nothing about us, um, without us. Mm. How do you react to this? And what advice from the elders' experience would you mm. give for um, these young leaders taking their plans forward? I'm even more excited about the young justice leaders having heard the approach because, uh, you know, it, it, it wants to uh, be very practical and co-create, as you, as you mentioned, um, the idea that justice shouldn't be elite, but it is. Um, it's, and it's perceived to be. It's remote. It's, you know, and um, it, it's really important that young people... Uh, speak about justice in terms that other young people will hear so that we break that barrier and that it becomes uh, you know, a way of understanding that we mean a very broad people-centered social justice, not just in courts justice. We mean um, community justice. And that requires data. And you, you both mentioned that quite strongly. I love the point about uh, often those who struggle for justice are those who need it. That's very true. You know, the human rights defenders, the um, uh, desperately, and they're often very under-resourced, underfunded. But actually, the whole justice system is underfunded. That's why uh, SDG 16 was so important. It was the most controversial, of course. I remember that very well because I had my uh, mandate as the special envoy on climate of the Secretary General before Paris. So I was sitting in listening to the whole SDG debate and having art uh, goal 13 on climate. But noting that goal 16 was the one that governments did not want. They did not want, and they, governments do not want to fund in the way they'll fund health or they'll fund education. And, and even you know, the, the, the philanthropic funding, it, it, you know, all of it is far less. And yet, um, you know, the issue of justice is so fundamental you know, for young people, for children. For the, and then another very valid point, um, that young people <coughs> should be at the table. And <clears throat> what I like um, now is not to be on uh, so-called high-level panels. I've never been asked to be on a low-level panel, but I, I do get asked to be on high-level panels. And very often there's one young person asked last, running out of time, hardly, you know, um, more recently at the Sustainable Energy for All um, in Kigali, um, I was never on a panel with one young person. It was always at least two young people, and it makes a difference. A, they don't use the, you know, they, 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 you get diversity, you get different points, but you get truth to power. And we heard, you know, your comments were very important because each of them was, you know, uh, these are points we need to be in the Justice Appeal 2023 um, for the SDG Summit. And I would just say, I would encourage you, be as ambitious as possible. Um, include as many young people, and I, I still mention children as possible, um, that, um, you know, fundamentally, this is the right that opens up other rights, you know. Um, it, it, and I like the idea of, you know, imagining um, a more just world, you know. Um, the world is broken at the moment, it's fragmented, it's, it, 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 there are so many problems, and having more sense of this broader people-centered justice would help uh, us to, you know, find a way through the common agenda to, to have a better world. So I'm excited. Let, yeah, so let's, let's build on that excitement and dig into it a little bit. I mean, Mary's mentioned children a couple of, a couple of times, and you know, obviously the young justice leaders are in their, in their 20s, you're flying around the world, you're independent, you're autonomous, you're making this stuff, this stuff happen. But what is the offer of the young justice leaders to, to younger? Um, children, is it something that you've thought about the justice needs for um, for people in a in a younger age group who are sometimes less able to to find these find these platforms? And also that that important um, breakthrough in the Convention on the Rights of the Child that children have rights and have the right to express their rights and have the right to be at the table in a in an in appropriate way for children. I mean, it's you know yeah. we don't we don't, the world isn't like that, you know. So how, how do you, sh let, me, let me turn that to you, Chanel. How do you think the group can, can work for, for and with children? 
I, I study law in, at the University of Auckland and one of the papers that I'm currently doing is family law. And family law looks at when families break down, what happens to the children. And what we know is that when a family breaks down, when a couple decides to dissolve their marriage, the first thing they do is dissolve their marriage. The second is that they share their property and then they talk about what happens to the children. And the problem that I often have with international law is that it says that you need to accommodate the views of children as far as it is reasonable, which means that accommodating children's views at some point becomes unreasonable. And the standard of reasonable is often used by states, like the New Zealand state, to exclude the views of children. People just think that accommodating the views of children is too much work, so they won't do it. I think we need to move from this idea of reasonably accommodating the voices of children to you must do it. Okay, let me, um, let me move to one of the questions. We've got a flood of questions coming online, and I do urge you, if you're watching on YouTube, taking part on Zoom, please get on the chat functions and feed questions in. Somewhere out there, there's a team filtering through them and then they're popping up on my, on my screen um, here. But I wanted to take one of the questions that I've heard from, um, from YouTube, from a, a user called Val Barnes 2001. Um, and Val Barnes 2001 says, we have billions of people on the um, planet. Most of them are poor. The poor are the ones most likely to experience injustices. What is justice for the poorer people in society, and how do we make sure that they get that? Can I can I address that at you, uh, Vino? Sure, definitely. Um, as somebody who come from poverty myself, I I was just able to get through basic education by getting scholarships because I was really good at school, but uh, my parents won't be able to afford private school if not for those discounts. So somebody coming from there and experiencing um, personally interacting with um, just the services take, for example, for children and the youth, um, I think something that um, we can work on would be making sure that... Um, Across social economic sectors, there should be fairness, and then there should be uh, everyone should be able to access services related to justice and even data. Take for example, because um, sometimes even getting devices or getting internet connection that is already um, setting people on the side. Um, having inaccessibility, take for example, that gives them less space, less opportunities to participate. So, um, take for example, in conversations, maybe we can ensure that there is inclusivity there, not just um, within the middle class or within um, the elite, but also just making sure that indigenous peoples are there, um, marginalized communities are there, those from um, um, lower socioeconomic classes are represented and heard, and they're... Um, they're not tokenized. We listen to them, we value their input, and then we apply it and act on it. And Mary, let me turn this back to you. You mentioned your work with the Commission on the Legal Empowerment mm -hmm. of the Poor. Um, from the Task Force on Justice, we, we heard this challenge was quite similar to the challenge that health faced in the 1970s mm -hmm. when there was this drive to get health out of hospitals, which of course still matter, but get it into communities mm -hmm. closer to people's lives. Do you think we're making progress in getting justice into people's communities, getting it closer to the people who need it most, or are we stuck? I think it makes a huge difference uh, when you have a... Uh, community-based access to legal services of all kinds. It, it really does. Uh, um, first of all, uh, the whole approach um, is, uh, is, is welcoming. It's a community mm. endeavor. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've seen in my own country, Ireland, uh, I'm very supportive of community-based um, legal services. Um, but uh, you know, there's also, and that I think was a very valid point, you, you need um, to have fairness and access to um, th the basics of, you know, health, education, etc., um, and then you need um, the the information which often can come through a community-based legal services approach, and that really um, helps greatly. I think it, it and. Uh, it just that doesn't exist in in so many places and isn't encouraged by governments because uh, they see um, that as being the start of criticism of the
the inequalities and the unfairnesses and the discriminations. Um, so yeah, that makes the justice fight more important, more difficult, and that's why we haven't been making. That's why there are so many gaps, and we, we, you know. And, and so, uh, I think we just have to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that this justice appeal 2023 is ambitious about what needs to change very significantly and fill those gaps. And the young leaders, the young justice group, I rely upon. <laughs> Truth to power, call us out, make sure, don't accept um, that uh, uh, the, the gaps will continue um, after 2023, if I could put it that way. Let, let's get on track to fulfill um, uh, um, uh, um, goal 16. And, and Mary, when, when you and Hina Jelani launched the elders' work on justice in Buenos Aires, I guess that was around four years ago um, now, you led a visit to a community justice centre in one of the poorest communities yeah. in, in Buenos Aires. Yeah. I remember three of the young women who were, mm. who were working there yeah. and how inspiring yeah. um, they were. What, what, give, give the viewers, uh, the, the listeners a sense of what it is actually like in one of these justice centres, yeah. what kind of work young people yeah. are doing there for their communities. I think it was very interesting, and I, I talked afterwards with Hina about this. We were both impressed that we went first to a government-run, quite good um, professional access to services. Um, you know, and the government felt they were doing a lot. And somehow the difference when it was a community-based, community-run, um, you know, we all sat in a circle, everybody was equal. Um, you know, uh, there was a wonderful um, woman, I've forgotten her name now, quite small, and she was a dynamo. And it just, you know, and, and, and we felt uh, that the community was e empowered by this centre you know, by the fact that uh, as of right, they were coming in with their problems and everybody was, you know, treated respectfully, listened to, um, you know, if it, 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 it just, you know, it just showed the difference uh, between a, a rather, you know, efficient but rather cold professional um, service to people who, who felt, I think, slightly, um, you know, um, they, were, they were the beneficiaries, but they weren't really um, being empowered. Uh, and I think that's that's why the people centered justice is such an important um, at the heart now of the task force, at the heart of the Justice um, Action Coalition, and at the heart of the Justice Appeal 2023. That's great, thank you. And I, you're getting lots of kudos online for your answers. Val Barnes, 2001, who asked the previous question, comes back and goes, "Mary really gets it." So uh, I think that's a strong strong endorsement from people out there. And do keep sending your. Um, your, your questions in. It's really great to, to see them. But Shanil, let's keep on this topic for a little bit longer. I mean, Mary, Mary's spoken about the struggle to provide justice within communities. She said that's often something that governments don't welcome. Um, and I think I know from your work that you also think that sometimes governments have set up legal systems that are, that are just fundamentally excluding people in one way or another. How do we begin to tear down those structural barriers and begin to level the playing field so that people aren't you know, just shut out by, by design from the justice system? On the original question about how we serve justice to people who are poor, um, New Zealand has one of the highest incarceration rates in the world. New Zealand also has one of the highest re-offending rates in the world. So what we know about our prisons is that they are not working. We spend about $100,000 a year to keep one person in prison. Ironically, the taxpayers do not want to pay the same kind of money to protect people outside prisons. So this whole idea of building prisons and investing tons of money to keep people inside it, but having no willingness to give them money while they're outside, makes no sense to me. And what we know is that people who are poor are more likely to be imprisoned for little crimes like using drugs, using cannabis, smoking cannabis. In New Zealand, you, go, you can go to jail for that. And, you know, young, poor people who are often suffering from mental health problems, who often are forced to commit crimes to survive, are imprisoned for just trying to make it through life. So I would recommend that we need a fundamental shift in what we resource. Let's stop building more prisons and throwing people in there and putting money to keep them in there. And let's ensure that people do not have the need to commit crime in the first place. Yeah, it's such an important... I could just add, and worse still, are privatised prisons. 
Yeah. Because having prisoners means it's a more lucrative profession. <laughs> I remember speaking to a new minister of justice and she'd just been to visit a, one of her prisons for the first um, the first time and she found in there a mother with her with a baby who should have been released six months previously was still in there and she was shocked by that and I said to her and you're paying yeah. taxpayers money to, to keep her there so I think this is really this shift of resources from what isn't working and what is perpetuating injustice to the people's sense of justice is an imp incredibly important theme we have a question um uh, here um, from William Gifford on on uh, on Twitter, and I'm going to um, turn that over to you, Vino. William says um, this discussion has touched on how youth can demand that the state upholds its responsibilities to ensure justice. But there's another side of the coin. Do the panelists see a role for youth in delivering justice beyond simply holding the state accountable? In other words, should we as young people rely on ourselves, not me, not as young people, on yourselves to deliver people um, centred justice? So I gather William is, is young as well and wondering about his role as a provider of justice. Mm -hmm. While young people can definitely contribute to attaining people centred justice, I don't see the youth movement as being separate from the efforts from other sectors. I feel like we as a community need to work together for us to be able to get there. Because definitely young people can do a lot when it comes to raising awareness, engaging people at the grassroots, um, building movements even. But then at the same time, if we disconnect ourselves from other sectors who are doing the same work, that would be really more difficult to attain. So I, I definitely think that um, multi-sector collaboration and co-creation is important. As somebody who's really active in the open government partnership, that is the way to go for me, just ensuring that um, while we work together, um, it is definitely inclusive and we see each other's contributions and build on those successes. Okay, so give us a little bit more detail on that. You talk about open government partnership, which for people don't know is a massive partnership in many, many countries that works to try and open government up so it's more accessible to people. And their, their, their philosophy is around co-creation. What does that actually mean and what does that look like in, in practice? How do you co-create change in country okay so um under the open government partnership especially um in, in the philippines um we create this action plan wherein governments and civil society organizations need to work together on a certain commitment so my organization youth alliance for freedom of information um we are advocating for the passage of a right to information act something that we don't have in the philippines so um Take, for example, uh, um, the government counterpart does engagement within um, the government agencies just to make sure that we have more freedom of information, government champions within government, and then engage legislators in um, knowing more about how freedom of information law will benefit their constituencies. Meanwhile, us in civil society, we engage other civil society organizations and the general public just so we create the public clamor so that um, ordinary people will tell their legislators, we want a, a freedom of information law, make it happen. Otherwise, we're voting you out next elections. Okay, that's great. And I'm going to come to you on this, uh, Chanel, because I've got a question from Elisa, and I don't think it's our Elisa. And she's asking how the young justice leaders plan to work with national um, and, well, with young people both nationally and locally to continue to develop and implement implement your plans? How do you make sure that this isn't just a group of seven, but it's a group that is seven million, seven, seven billion? Yeah, <laughs> seven billion. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I can talk, uh, well, the thing is that we're seven young people from different parts of the world. So you've got someone from the United States and then you've got someone from New Zealand and we're on the opposite ends of the globe. And so that already builds a partnership across the globe. So that's the first thing that we do as a group. But I think we all came into this group already having connections to our community. So I think a fundamental requirement to being a young justice leader was that you are connected to the people on the ground. So back home, on my Instagram, I have 58,000 followers. And the way that I've gathered that is through working with young people on the ground. When I started the movement to ban conversion therapy, people started listening and they started reaching out. And for me, it was about ensuring that they 
believe in me to deliver that on behalf of them. And a part of getting them to trust me was working with them rather than for them. And I think a lot of the times people, elitist young people, um, are too invested in building a name for themselves and forget about the people that they are serving. And I think as young justice leaders, we always reminded that we have communities to serve and we always take back what we have here to them. Great. Thank you so much for that. I mean, we've been on a fairly positive note, but let's look at some of the, you know, the darker side. When we do live in incredibly difficult times, the world seems to barrel from one emergency to another emergency. And Mary, you know, in your work, you know, the climate crisis is, you know, right deep into the critical, um, critical zone. We have, you know, red signals on peace. There are just a food crisis that is, you know, gathering pace. And then just this tidal wave of injustice in the world that is often bringing young people out onto the, onto the streets. We've got a question from Leia here on the Elders YouTube channel and she says you know with all this injustice in the world what gives you hope in your justice work and do you do you sometimes feel despair do you sometimes feel mm. that it is actually mm. hopeless yeah it was it was interesting when i um was working as uh, the un high commissioner for human rights um i found that going out into the places where there was the most injustice gave me the most hope because there were people struggling for that justice and they were so courageous, they were so impressive, they were so inspirational. I would always come back to the office and people say to me, you know, you've come back energised. And I was, genuinely. And, and I think that's very true that, um, you know, there are so many problems. I've just been in two places in Africa, in Rwanda and in South Africa for the Elders Board meeting, etc. And I was conscious, you know, that you have a war in Ukraine but the impacts are being felt so acutely because there are the three Fs, food, fuel, and fertilizer. And it's just impacting. And, you know, when we were in South Africa, President Ramaphosa told us that the COVID crisis caused two million people to lose their jobs in South Africa. And now those people are facing much higher food and fuel costs. And, you know, it's driving them into a, a, an even worse poverty. And uh, he called it the bystander issue you know, bystanders to this terrible war, the invasion by Russia of Ukraine, but actually the impacts and, you know, the need to open up um, the Odessa port and open up that um, grain and, and, and they, um, is, is very acute. So, you know, we, we have a series of crises now that countries are facing and it's quite destabilizing. There is the climate crisis and it is, you know, the, the window is you know, really closing in a way that uh, we're going to have to step up dramatically. But you then had the COVID crisis with the inequitable access to vaccines. We, you know, the lack of global partnership governance. And then you have the now uh, inflation, food and fuel and, and fertilizer prices. So uh, I think we're in a, a very difficult time in our world, which the elders are acutely conscious of. And, um, you know, uh, it's going to be harder um, because, you know, of the Security Council being blocked because of the veto by, by Russia, etc. Um, so, uh, and, and, and indeed support from other members of the Security Council. Um, but I, I feel um, that the hope is that we have a very young world and we have young people all over the world. And I really feel that um, the elders, in wanting to do all of our work very intergenerationally, which we um, sort of made even clearer in our strategy going forward, um, whether we work on nuclear, whether we work on climate, you know, on these existential threats, we want to work intergenerationally. Justice, we want to work intergenerationally for the very good reason that this is the much more powerful way of trying to address very, very real uh, problems and, you know, a world that is much, much more difficult than it was when I was High Commissioner for Human Rights. And, you know, let me turn this to you. I mean, you, your base and your work has been in the Philippines, but increasingly you're working in, in countries uh, across, the, across the region, many of which have been battered um, by this wave of crisis that we feel. How, how do you keep hope how do you um find a light in that in these in these dark times and and what is your response to the crisis in the in the countries that you're that you're working with so 
in the Philippines, we have this term called bayanihan. So basically, that is um, having this sense of community wherein if you see your neighbor having having less food or scarcity in food and you have an extra, you give it to them. So that is how we're coping, definitely. Um, helping um, relatives or other um, members of the community get by. But then at the same time, this is not a sustainable solution. So um, definitely there needs to be further discussion on how to address this, and especially in the global south, wherein um, I have um, workmates working in Sri Lanka who are really suffering at the moment. Yeah. So, um, you know, while it is from, from the grassroots, it seems like we're kind of helpless and, and we're just getting by by helping each other, I, I think there needs to be some um, clamor to assert some concrete action, not just from governments, but also um, across um, groups, like take, for example, in the ASEAN. And let me turn this to, um, to you, Chanel. And if, if you could just actually focus on the people who are working to provide justice, how, how, do, we, how do we care for them? How do we sustain them? How do we keep them, um, keep them fresh, keep them able to? to deliver the, the promise? Well, the climate crisis from where I come from is quite bleak. I was born in Fiji and uh, a lot of the villages have been relocated because our land can no longer, it's no longer livable. Um, places like the United States and the UK, they're not going to feel the climate crisis until we in the Pacific are completely gone. You know, in Aotearoa, we have this concept of kaitiakitanga, and that means that we have a duty to care for the environment. In indigenous populations, there's no such thing as owning the land, because we are a part of the land. Any harm that is done to our land is done to us. So every earthquake, every tsunami, every natural disaster is a cry for the earth to connect with indigenous peoples. And I think that uh, what gives me hope is that indigenous, young indigenous people, and you may have worked with many of them, is that they in the Pacific are leading the action for climate, climate action. And I, it's just really bleak when you see your, your people who are not being granted uh, the right to move as refugees to other land, die out in lands that are dying. So it's bleak, and I, and I guess for young Pacific people who are just constantly fighting at the front lines, there is very little time to sit around and talk about hope. We just got to get to it. And Mary? I, I needed to come back in because as chair of the elders, if I didn't, um, you know, um, quote what I've learned from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. <laughs> uh, he was being accused of being an optimist a few years ago on a panel, and he said, oh no, I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope. Mm. And that resonated hugely with me at the time because uh, it means that you have the energy to take the next step that has to be taken, whatever it is. And then talking, both of you, about you know, um, Ubuntu, you know, the, the whole spirit of Ubuntu, which also continues to inspire us as, um, as um, elders. And actually, there's an equivalent in my own country, Ireland. It's the spirit of Mehel, which I, I, I'd hate to tell you how it's spelt. You wouldn't believe it. But, um, and it's, it's, again, you know, it's something that I recognized when I was campaigning to become president of Ireland, um, because um, I could see Ireland was benefiting from um, the agricultural policy of the European Union, but um, the, 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 the towns around and the countryside didn't have the facilities. So communities were coming together for facilities for young people, for the elderly, you know, and, and it was exactly that. And now, in a downturn, it, that comes out again. But um, I wanted to also pick up on the um, self-care. Um, you know, I, I think this is incredibly important. Uh, young people have suffered greatly because of a climate anxiety, and now COVID has had huge, dramatic, negative impacts on mental health that we still don't fully understand. And uh, I think we need to, to know that people like you two and, o and other, um, you, you three, <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're working and um, you can get exhausted, you can get burnt out. You have to, and that's why your point about even having resources is important, yeah, because that helps. But also uh, to have other things that that help to, to 
um, distraction, um, 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 you know, um, whether it's music, whether it's walking in the forest, whether it's doing yoga or meditation, whatever it is, you know, to, to always be conscious of your self-care, especially when you're working in, in tough environments. I think this is really, really important and powerful, um, powerful advice. I wanted to, you know, we're beginning to move towards the end of this, um, in, end of this session. Mary's mentioned a few times this appeal for 2023, this call from the justice community that's assembled here in The Hague really to step up on justice for all as we reach the halfway point of the SDGs. I want to go to each of our panellists and ask for one hope, one wish, one commitment for 2023. What is it, Vino, that you think that you want to help make happen in this critical year that we're that we're heading heading towards? Well, definitely inclusion of more children and youth at the discussions. So we're just two, Shanil and I were just two representatives, but I think there are more in, in Asia, in the Pacific, and in other parts of the world who want to be part of that conversation. So maybe the next year we will also spend our time listening to their narratives, their perspectives, and their ideas on how children and the youth can contribute to this agenda because I definitely think we can definitely get creative and maybe we can surprise you with fresh ideas. And, and Chenille, I mean, you're coming off this success on <laughs> banning conversion therapy and I know from our chat yesterday that you're beginning to think about what comes, what comes next. What do you think you hope to achieve in 2020 yes, through um, the Young Justice Leaders? New Zealand is one of five countries in the entire world that have a national ban on gay and gender conversion therapy, which leaves places like even the Netherlands not in that list. And I think uh, leaders all around the country need to start talking about the fundamental rights of queer people. But I also wanted to send a very quick message to young people around the world. Scare the status quo. We're not going to get our rights by being nice to people. For a very long time, the status quo has used standards of civility to cancel anyone who retaliates against them. We need less civility and more chaos against the status quo. It was the, um, it was the slogan of the Next Generation Fellows in their report for the Secretary General. It's not our job to agree with you, which I thought was just such a great, um, great line. Mary, time for the young people to challenge the status quo, but what's the breakthrough that you're hoping for? in 2023? Because I remember the difficulty of uh, agreeing um, Goal 16, uh, I would like those governments that have been giving leadership um, so far uh, to actually begin to gather in more governments. You know, we need more governments to be part of this um, Justice Appeal 2023 uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Ultimately, justice is the responsibility of governments. Yes, I'm a great a supporter of the open government um, uh, movement and have taken part in quite a lot of discussions. And I love the links with um, different aspects of society and, uh, and in particular, um, civil society organisations. But ultimately, there is a responsibility. And not enough governments are being you know, encouraged into that responsibility. So I would like to see uh, you know, a significant increase in the number of governments that join the Justice Appeal 2023. And I think it's the responsibility of those governments that have already joined to take it upon themselves to widen the circle. And how do you think this, this intergenerational conversation can be, can be continued? How would you urge young people to work with the elders to take their aspirations forward? I think the approach is absolutely right. Um, not necessarily to agree, but to be truth to power. Um, and to be representative as you are. Um, that's, that's, that's what yeah, is so valuable in the intergenerational conversation. And I think you know, having a good um, intergenerational conversation in the justice area is, is, is vital um, because uh, young people um, you know, are you know, so disproportionately affected as are young, um, you know, as are women and girls, um, uh, uh, you know, as, as we know. So, uh, you know, I think, also, um, you know, young people drive an agenda well. So I'm, you know, more confident that we will fill some of those gaps, that we will make a difference if we have, as we have now, um, this young leaders, young justice leaders who uh, are clearly, 
going to, I don't know whether chaos is the right word. I mean, I'm not sure now, but, uh, but certainly, um, uh, you know, I think uh, interrupt, make sure you're there, uh, make waves, that's it. <laughs> so this is a time for making waves. This is a time of opportunity in 2023. It's now coming to the end of the session. As a moderator, my main job is not to finish too late, um, too beyond our, our schedule. I think we've had an amazing conversation uh, here today. It's, I'm, I'm really delighted to see the Young Justice Leaders formally launch as a, as a group, having been uh, a witness to that first conversation when the idea um, came up of forming the group. I think it's got massive potential within the context of the Justice um, Action Coalition. I'm so pleased to see the Young Justice Leaders and the Elders working um, together and, and standing true to that sp spirit of intergenerational dialogue. And I'd, I'd particularly like to thank Mary as chair of the elders for taking time out of a packed, packed travel schedule to, um, to, to come and talk to the young justice leaders today. Thank you so much to Chenille and to Vino and to Lisa, who I know will still be listening on online for your leadership in making this um, group happen. And to Pathfinders, the elders, the World Justice Project, all the other partners who've made this event, event possible. If you're listening online, please do rally, please do get in touch, please do, if you're young, please do um, get in touch with the Young Justice Leaders. Think about the SDG Summit in September 2023 and make sure that is a breakthrough and transformational moment for justice. That's the end of the session. Thank you all very much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Goodbye.